2001 Aggie graduate, so get a whoop for that, right? And he is the assistant general manager at Ben E. Keith, specifically in their Selma division. Now, Benny Keith is a broadline food and distribution company. We have worked with them very closely over the course of the past seven years, and it's been so much fun to see the students who are in this class go to work for great companies like Benny Keith in the food distribution industry. Whenever the first time I saw this presentation, I didn't have really an idea for what the food distribution industry looked like, but he's going to walk you through a wide variety of opportunities that an industry that is so large can really provide. So he got up before breakfast this morning, came all the way in from San Antonio, so please help me give him a warm Aggie welcome. Howdy. 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 So as she said, I was 2000, uh, class of 2001. I took the class back in 2000, and it uh, kind of led me to, to what I'm doing today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. She also pointed out that some of you might not have been born when I took the class, so that made me feel great. Keith, so, uh, you rode along with somebody with me. Right? I did, yes. For that study of salesperson topic. I did, right. <laughs> and that, I kind of want to get into that, but what I wanted to do first is since food, food service distribution is kind of the hidden industry that people don't think about. So we know where the manufacturing comes from. We know the people, you know, the food comes from the farms and manufacturing plants and things like that. And then we eat it in restaurants, but it's that in between where we lie that a lot of people aren't that familiar with. So. I wanted to start off and talk about that a little bit and then get a little bit into my story and why I'm here. So, I uh, can't thank you for having me. So, does anybody know, Benny is a broadline of food distribution company, is what he's stated. Does anybody know what that is for what we do? Take a guess. No? Nobody's ready yet? Okay. Um, uh, food service distribution is a company that provides food and non-food items to restaurants who are operating and preparing foods in bulk quantities. So when it doesn't make sense to go to the HEB and load up the 10, 12 shopping carts and, and get everything and try to put that in your car and get to your facility, that's where we come in. So we have our own transportation service. Uh, we buy directly from the manufacturers. And we're that in between where we can buy big truckload quantities and then provide that back to the operators uh, only in the quantities that they need to get through their days or weeks. Now, we are a, the, our type of customers would be uh, restaurants, hospitals, nursing homes, catering, you know, anybody who's preparing mass quantities of food at a time. So we're a broad line, as I mentioned, and we're set up to be kind of that one-stop shop where they can get everything they need uh, off of one truck and one delivery. And so that would include produce, which is fresh from frozen vegetables, um, dry goods, that's your grocery items, so flour, sugar, condiments, spices, uh, canned goods, those kind of materials, and then uh, frozen goods. So those are going to be uh, frozen breads, appetizers, french fries, uh, a lot of the desserts are, are pre-made now. Uh, so that falls in that frozen category. And then our proteins, we carry in both fresh and frozen varieties on uh, seafood, poultry, beef, and pork. And then the non-foods items, those are going to be everything that you need to eat and prepare meals, but you don't. it's not actually food, but it gets thrown away. So those are your foam cups, uh, plates, um, Plastic cutlery, you know, those are the fork knives for the kids. And even the chemicals used to clean the facilities or dishwashers and those kind of things. And then the last category we have is equipment and supplies. And we have full lines of these as well. And that's everything from the plates and glassware that go on the table to the utensils used to prepare the meals all the way up to the, the, the grills and ovens and stuff in the kitchen. So you can kind of see where we run the gamut on everything that a, that a restaurant would need to actually bring in and prepare food and these type of quantities. So I want to show a video that kind of talks, it does a really good job of illustrating all the different things that have to happen on a daily basis uh, to get the product in the house and then get it out to the customers. Signature dishes, they be fine at restaurant, 
but without the food and ingredients for them, they never happen. Professional kitchens, from fine dining restaurants to college cafeterias, count on the best food being available on time, every time, and delivered in perfect condition. And that's only possible because of what food service distributors do. How do distributors ensure a safe and efficient supply chain? How do we make high quality food sourced from hundreds of manufacturers available on demand? How do we get ingredients our customers need from our warehouse to their professional kitchen? It begins when a product reaches our warehouse. We unload the products, inspect them to ensure nothing has been damaged, check the quantity, quality, and temperature to make sure they're right. If anything isn't, it never gets to our customers. Then we enter them into our inventory. That's when the forklifts come in. It's called put away, and it's not as simple as it sounds. We track and manage where everything is. We rotate stock so our customers are always getting the freshest ingredients. For dry <coughs> ingredients or canned goods, we store them at the optimal temperature. For products that require refrigeration, we use our refrigerators and freezers. And these aren't your standard refrigerators. These are tens of thousands of cubic feet big. Each one has multiple temperature zones and different humidity levels, ensuring that every product, from a head of lettuce to ice cream, is stored in the exact environment required for safety and freshness. Why do we do this? Why take such care? Because when a customer places an order, we want to get it right, the first time and every time. And when an order comes in, a whole new set of protocols spring into action. We plan how the truck will be loaded for maximum efficiency. <coughs> Map the route, delivery sequence, temperature control, avoid cross-contamination. Once complete, the selectors start building pallets by moving through the warehouse to pick each item for the shipment. They ensure the right product and the right quantity are selected for each customer. Label the items on each pallet and then stage the pallets for loading onto the trucks. During this process, they are sure to follow established requirements for freshness and safety. So why is all this so important? Because in the U.S. alone, hundreds of millions of meals are enjoyed away from home each day. And food service distributors deliver millions of cases of product to make that all possible. Our job is vital, even if people outside the food service industry don't know about us. From hospitals to middle schools, from your favorite restaurant to a company cafeteria, Food service distributors ensure professional kitchens have fresh, safe food so that a chef can delight every customer. Quite a bit going on just to get that product to the restaurant. And if you think about it, so how many of you have uh, Amazon Prime accounts? I know it's been around a while, but when that came out, that was the greatest thing in the world, right? Because we could get on, we could buy something online, and it would be at our door usually within 24, 48 hours. If you think about it, these customers are placing orders for up to 200 cases. They have up to 5 p.m. the day before to put those orders in, and the most time we're turning it around and we get it to them sometimes 4, 4 a.m., 5 o'clock in the morning the next day, and it's within a two-hour window, and we're filling the orders at a 90% uh, accuracy rate. So it, it gets touched by a lot of people very quickly uh, to get it out there. So. Amazon takes two days to get you one or two cases. So there's a lot of different things going on to get it there. So as Cody mentioned, um, I actually rode with the salesperson out of this class. Most of the people in the industry come, most of the people that are sales folks in our industry come from a, a, an operator standpoint. So either they were managing restaurants or they were uh, cooking in the kitchen, or they were servers, wait staff, those kind of things. And that's how they became aware of what food distribution was, because they saw it coming in on the trucks at the locations that they worked at. Uh, and they, they came over to this side of it because they didn't want to work all the night hours or every weekend or those things, which is where most of the restaurants are, are busy. Uh, a lot of them, too, took, there was better financial opportunity on this side than there might, there might have been in the operator side. So, but not everybody does. Myself, I never worked in any kind of restaurant or in the industry at all. I came out of school and learned about the industry because I did that outside right along uh, with somebody who's a food service rep for a company out of Houston. And I, I did it as part of the class. You know, I, I thought of myself, I was an ad guy. I wasn't going to be in sales. I was going to go work for 
Purina or Cargill or one of those companies. But I graduated in uh, December of 2001, three months after the 9-11 attacks. And so a lot of those companies weren't hiring. They were on freezes because the economy took a hit at that time. So I called up the individual I'd read with, and he said, no, you know, everybody's got to eat. Things are still going good in our world. Um, the territory's still growing. Income's still growing. So we did some research and decided Ben and Keith was, was the company I wanted to work for because I liked their philosophy. They wanted to take, they wanted to hire the best people and take really good care of them so that those people would then in turn take good care of the customers and, and grow, the, grow the business for the company. So in January of 2002, I started with the company as a sales trainee, was a, a district sales representative in the Hill Country area, and then uh, district sales manager for a little while, ran, went into purchasing, ran the frozen foods and the seafood uh, section of our business. And then uh, about six years ago, I went to the assistant general manager for San Antonio, which is what I'm doing now. And there, my responsibilities, I work with the sales teams from San Antonio through South Texas. And then I also work with our operations team, which is the warehouse that things we saw here, the transportation uh, out to our customers. So I don't say any of that to, to brag or be boastful in any way. What, the reason I bring it up is to, you know, this is the industry I didn't know anything about. And as you're going through and you're trying to decide what you want to do or what you're interested in, I would just recommend keeping an open mind and look for things, kind of challenge yourself to go find things that you don't know about to see where the opportunities may truly lie for yourself and what may be your interest. In. Any questions about anything so far? So, District sales representative, I've said it a couple of times, that's kind of the industry standard for what the, the sales force are. And DSR is the acronym commonly referred to. So uh, I'm going to make somebody answer this time. What is, what, does somebody have any idea what a district salesperson in the food service industry kind of does on a daily basis? Yes, ma'am. Um, don't they go around to customers checking on maybe like placing the order or see how they're doing? <coughs> right, absolutely. So, not ninety percent of our sales come from replenishment orders. So we grab, we, we work with the customers that become part of our account, and that is that is that is where our sales come from is restocking their shelves. And most customers will order uh, two to three times a week on average. Now, now that is an average. You might have a big, large customer that needs product every day, or they have smaller facilities, so they need stuff every day. But for the most part, it's about two to three times a week. You might have some uh, daycares or small, smaller operations that may not get orders, but every other week or even once a month, depending on the size of it. And so that's kind of the frequency of how we would call on uh, a current customer is how many times they're ordered. So in the old days, we used to, you'd go every time they ordered. So you may go to their account two to three times a week if that's how they were ordered. Now we've got technology so they can put their orders in online. Uh, some of them call in to, to voicemail systems and leave orders that didn't send to their DSRs electronically. Um, but it's, it's changed a lot. But yes, replenishment orders is the main thing. Anything else that you think the DSR might have the responsibility to do? Yes, Yep. So prospecting is a huge piece of what we do. It's important in any sales field because we want to grow customers for the for the company. And that's what we're there to do is grow the customer base. But in the restaurant industry, attrition will take away ten to twenty percent of the accounts. And that doesn't mean 20, 10 to twenty percent of the <coughs> productivity of the industry goes away. What that means, because you're going to have big customers that are established customers that are going to continue to do well, but how many times have you driven by or you've gone to a restaurant you go by a week later and it's closed? Nobody's there. You know, things happen. Um, that happens all the time. So the amount of accounts disappear 10 to 20 percent of your customer base is just going to go away. So if you're not growing and adding customers at a higher rate than that, then not only can you not grow, you're actually going to start going backwards pretty quick. So prospecting is extremely important. Uh, who's got an idea of a good way that we go about getting these customers? I mean, restaurants are 
it's no secret when they come up, they're being built, they're big signs, so we all know they're talking to people or they know them. Right. So the old-fashioned way to do it, and the way it's still done most often, is literally just getting in the car driving and saying, there's a restaurant, I'm going to go call on and see what happens. Uh, we can get a little bit more sophisticated now. We've got some programs where we can type in zip codes, and it'll show all the food service operators within an area. Because you will find things, you know, you may have a, an office building that you wouldn't think of, but they're serving lunch to the employees inside. So things like that can find some of those little hidden gems and places like that that you go call on as well to, to find out. The other difference between our industry and some of the others is the competition talks to each other a whole lot within, within the restaurant world. You know, most industries, competitors, you know, stay away from each other. They don't want to share secrets. But in the rest, the philosophy is different. They want people coming to the area to eat or that section of town. Or they want to be known for their food. So they'll talk to each other and they'll actually tell and say, hey, this is working for me, this is not. And the employees move around a lot, too. So you may have a dishwasher that becomes a line cook, that becomes a kitchen manager, that becomes a general manager, and he's moving around restaurants the whole time. So if you've got relationships with those folks that are moving around, then when they go to the new restaurant, you want them to call and say, hey, I'm having a problem with, with X. Can you come over and help me out here? So there's a, it's a huge referral uh, business within the, within the restaurant world. So a uh, great way. Some of our veteran reps, although we still want them going out and finding new customers, they actually get 90% of the new customers just through the referral because they've made so many connections by being in their territory. So the, the customer retention piece is a big one we talked about. Um, and not only is it replenishment, but it's a very competitive industry. A lot of our competitors have the same type of products that we have. So we have to do something constantly to be that value to the customer so that they stay, that they stay with us. So if all we're doing is replenishing their shelves, you're going to have five or six more people coming in that door that can replenish their shelves as well as you. So what are some of the things that we do to, to keep the customers on our side? So product quality is a big one. And matching up the products for the customers and helping them decide, okay, you know, my, my target market is this and I need to, uh, this is their price point then I'm going to suggest this type of item because you know, if it's a white tablecloth steakhouse, I want to have you know one of the best beef programs out there that we can have so it lives up to their quality standards. If I'm serving steak but it's on an all-you-can-eat buffet line, if they have the best quality beef program, they're probably not going to have that, that buffet price high enough to cover that cost. So even though they can have a great product, they can lose money quickly if, they're, if, they have, if their stuff is too expensive. So what do I find that fits their market? Uh, doing all those things and, and providing that return on investment to the customer so that they can make more money, <coughs> bringing new ideas. Uh, the lady mentioned sampling customers is huge. You know, whether it be to change out some of the stuff or something they can make more money on or they get a better return or uh, new menu items to keep, to keep things fresh with, with their patrons to keep their patrons coming in. So those are the things that then we don't get looked at as the person who brings the order to me. We become part of their business and helping them uh, make money. <coughs> so another one is uh, promotion opportunities. So we have vendors that work with us that would like us to sell more of their products. So we'll make put deals together and we'll have promotions where uh, the, the salesmen, sales reps will get uh, additional income sometimes or they can earn trips to different places just by kind of focusing on certain manufacturers or certain items or certain types of products. And we'll take money from the vendors and we'll, we'll give that back to the sales force uh, by talking to their customers and pushing those items. Just this year, uh, we take groups of people to... Uh, San Diego, there was a trip to Los Angeles last weekend, Miami, there's a Guatemala fishing trip where one boat caught like 70 sailfish in a day. So uh, a lot of different opportunities as far as that goes. And uh, 
probably 75% of these trips, there's an invite to a spouse, a spouse or significant other who can actually go with the people who win these trips and have a really good time. Any other yes, sir. You know that competition within the AP, there is every seller have their own specific territory? What was the, did you say competition? Yeah, competition between sales and We do. Um, we try to keep it healthy competition. Because there can be some, you know, I was calling on that. And this guy's brother's over here. I need that one. We keep that, but uh, what we really do to, to keep that professional is just the culture of the company and really have it feel like a family atmosphere to where we're working together as a team. And then we can do friendly competition, which these promotions are. So they're fighting against each other to see who can win the trips and who can do this and who can get that bonus. Uh, and in most times, it's, it's, it's really a, a friendly competition amongst ourselves. Um, as far as territories, we don't put really geographic restrictions on, on our salespeople. Some of our competitors will literally have where you can't go past this stop site, you can't go past here. This, this is your area for him to enter competition. Right. Uh, we don't do that. If you've got uh, somebody that you know that's on this side of town and they're going to do business with you, not doing business with them, and by all means, go for that business for um, My territory was in the Hill Country, really serviced with, uh, basically in the Kerrville market, but my biggest account was actually on Laredo. It was all because of a relationship I had. They opened a David Buster's type style place down there, and it did really well for a long time. Uh, now, we do want to work with those folks, and because you can't sell behind a windshield. So if you're just spending all your day driving back and forth and you're not strategic about what you're doing, or if this customer in Laredo wanted to see me two or three times a week, that probably wouldn't have been a good idea. Because that's, that's a three-hour drive one way and I'm not selling anything during that entire time. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good one, right? Um, do y'all, depending on where y'all are located, do y'all like, um, buy from local farmers? We do. Um, but we have to be very careful. So the number one uh, foodborne illness over the last five years has, has been produce. So spinach was a big one. Uh, you had the Chipotle deal where that was all coming from local produce. They got those folks sick. So I'm not, that, that's in no way a knock on local produce farmers or, or anything like that. But we have to make sure that the farmers that we are buying from are going through the steps to prevent that. And so there's a very rigorous process that a, that a producer has to go through to be able to come into our facility to keep our customers safe and their customers safe. So we do buy a lot of produce from the valley and some different places around us. Uh, we buy fresh seafood straight out of the Corpus area in South, South Texas and shrimp boats and things like that. Uh, we have an expensive list of Joe Texan manufacturers that we can promote. Uh, but in most cases, we buy from the people who can provide the best product at the best price. If that's local, then we go local. Uh, if it's not, I mean, nobody nobody in the world can grow lettuce like the Salinas Valley in California. They just have the conditions to grow it better and cheaper than anybody else. Uh, tomatoes is kind of the same thing coming out of Florida and in California as well. So uh, we do supplement some of that locally, but when the quality and, and everything else is coming out at a cheaper price, and that's what the customers are, are most likely to do. Keith, can you share with them about how you guys could track that in your system when, whenever they recently had that outbreak of E. coli in spinach? Can you tell them about the process of that because your system, your tracking system in the warehouse is, is really incredible for them to hear about too. So we were a member of Marcon. It's a co-op. It's a produce co-op. Uh, the company is based in Salinas, California. Marcon is the label that most of that comes out in. And they have codes, so they, just because they're in Salinas doesn't mean all their product comes from Salinas. The lettuce is actually moved this time of year, they're coming out of Arizona. And then we do have different vendors uh, locally and elsewhere around the country that pack certain things. But it's all controlled by the Marcon group. And their standards are extremely high. So for the lettuces, it's, it's called first crop, which means they get, they get to pick the fields they want to pull out of, and they get to pick the rows they want to pull out of. And you might think, well, it's all grown the same, what difference does it make? Well, if you think of it, you know, the rows on the outside, 
there are usually gravel roads next to it, so the cars driving by, they get dust on those. So it may uh, dirty the, in, the integrity of the product. If it's under power lines, it's got birds, which drop droppings, which creates disease. So they won't pull on any of those roads for their first crop. So they pick the first run, and then a lot of the other companies will come in and they'll clean out the fields behind them. So that's some of the things we do to, to uh, get better quality and better integrity from the beginning. But then every box of every produce has a code on it. And it will tell us exactly what date, what field, and what row that product came from. So anytime there's an outbreak, we know within a matter of hours because they, they, they've actually gotten very good, especially on the coli, of identifying where it originated from. And so we can know within a matter of hours <coughs> any of our codes that are in stock or that went out within the last week match up with anywhere that there might have been an indication of, of the E. coli outbreak. And so we can immediately uh, quarantine the product in our, in our building, and we know exactly what customer got what code so we can call customers and say, hey, this is product that you want, or so on and so forth. That's the way it's built to work. The way it actually works is we can call them and say, look, everybody else can, has to throw away their remain, which is the big one that happened uh, a few months ago. Uh, you guys are safe. You can use your romaine. We've already checked it. It came from nowhere near the Ecoli breakout. And then their restaurant can be the ones that can continue to serve the Caesar salads where everybody else says, no, i got to pour from the menu. You can't have it. So it works works both ways, but it, it's, it's a good system that keeps it safe. Uh, works in seafood, too, and that we pick vendors who have those processes in place so that they can tell us what's going on. Uh, there was a deal a while back where uh, swai and tilapia are oriental species of fish. They're actually the most used fish and menus in the U.S. now. Uh, a lot of catfish that you're eating in restaurants is actually coming out of the swai product. Now, there's still a lot of American catfish out there, uh, but the, the swai product is a, a Vietnamese species of catfish, and it's very similar. There was, uh, I think it was Joe's Crab Shack, a media outlet got a hold of some information. And just like everybody, you got some bad producers, and they got a hold of the video showing bad stuff going on in these fields of Vietnam, and it was bad. But it had nothing to do with what Joe's Crab Shack was was selling. But the news, news media outlet called and told them, uh, we're about to run this, this news broadcast tonight, and if you don't have anything to disprove what we're going to say, we're going to run it. And they weren't even saying Joe's Crab Shack was serving, but that's what they were putting on the paper. So the implication was, that's what you were going to eat if you went and ate at Joe's Crab Shack. The seafood company that we used was the one involved in this. And within an hour and a half, they had all the documents from Vietnam at the manufacturer plant showing exactly what the process went through for the fish that was being served at Joe's Crab Shack and uh, sent that information to the news media outlet along with a letter from the attorney saying, if you run that, put our picture anywhere on it, we will sue the car at you. So uh, those are the kind of companies that we really strive hard to work with so that those kind of things don't happen and we can keep the, the uh, customers visiting the restaurants so that we all can continue to to grow and make money together. Yes, sir. Uh, so if a food retailer already has a distributed company, how do you show them that your company is better? So the, the one thing we do, and it kind of goes back to what I was talking about before, the culture we have when we're really uh, out to get the best people in the industry and give them the tools that they need to be successful and not have as many hurdles as we possibly can, um, creates an organization where we can put the best consultative person into the restaurant. So they're there truly to help that customer grow and do the things we were talking about earlier uh, and not just be there to say, okay, what do you need? You know, I got the cheapest price on beans, I got the cheapest price on beans. Because if you go in and just sell them on price, um, you can get kicked out because anybody can find a way to be cheaper on a certain time if they find out that's what they're not like. So that's really our deal is to continue to, to work on our culture so that we get the best people from the industry working with our, our team so that that in turn provides the best customer service to the customer. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're, um, I was just, how big is it that y'all are not just like Texas or y'all in like somewhere 
So we do, uh, there's some things that I'll get to in a minute, but uh, we actually operate in 18 states. We have eight divisions. And we're kind of, if you look at the, what, put it in football terms, if you look at the SEC Democrat, that's where we go. So we don't get all the way into the southern Florida now, but we go from uh, New Mexico across all the southern states. We have a new facility in Alabama, and then we, uh, we have Little Rock. So even though we are regional, we're still the eighth largest in the country. So the areas that we do operate in are uh, fairly strong. Just in San Antonio market alone, we have over 500 employees out of that. Yes, sir. So you mentioned earlier that you have a 99% success rate in four quarters. That 1% of the time is like go wrong. What do you have to do to make that up? So it depends on the situation. So if it's usually... Um, we'll call the customer, the customer calls the salesman. So anytime we don't deliver something, either the, the salesman is notified at night that we don't have the product at all. So they'll call the customer and say, hey, we don't have this, do you want to sell it with a different item, or work out something beforehand. Or if, it, if they can't find it in the warehouse that night, or if it gets damaged on the truck, it then sends a notification back to the salesperson as soon as that delivery is made, so they know. And they're usually calling the customer and saying, hey, I saw you didn't get this product. Uh, are you good till your next order? Or do you need it now? And if they say, I need it now, then we'll, we'll figure out a way to run a hot shot out to them to try to avoid because it's very expensive. But we got to do that to, to keep the customer service. And last week was Valentine's. So it's you know, a big thing. We had a, a bigger truck. They didn't come in with our uh, ribeyes. You can imagine how many people were ordering ribeyes. So last Friday we had the transportation team, extra team come in, and so they ran their regular routes, and then they went back out this after that afternoon to resurface with some ribeyes. And it was all the vendors' fault, but we can't tell the customer that because uh, they don't care. It's Valentine's, and they're out of ribeyes. Yes. Now you said that the turnaround of the orders be there about that morning. Does that mean that your distribution sides are in the city limits usually? No, so from San Antonio, from our warehouse there, we ship from Philippe to Brownsville and from Del Rio over to uh, past Columbus. So CV kind of falls into the Houston division. So that, that's a pretty good footprint that all those products are coming out of San Antonio every night. Uh, the way we do that is we run shuttles, so you probably, if you haven't, you'll notice now, you'll see our trucks or some of our competitors' trucks where they're pulling two trailers at a time down the highway. What they'll do is we'll have shuttles at the shuttle sites. So we've got an office in Austin, we've got an office in, in the Ferry and the Valley in between the Cowan and the uh, And they'll run one truck, his, his whole job that evening is to drive from the Valley up with two empty trailers that got used that day pick up two full ones, and then come back. He makes that trip every single night. And then we have local drivers that will get up that early that morning, grab the two full trailers, split them up with their single trucks, and they'll go make you know, 10 to 15 deliveries within that market into those trucks. So that's how we, we get out of the far areas uh, without having to drive as many miles. Yes, sir. So, I think he really is a fabulous company, but I was curious, what is it that y'all do to maintain your market share and even grow against such large competitors such as Cisco? Yeah, so within our market share, um, we, so some people and our customers ask us, this, okay, Cisco's worldwide. How do you get the same price in there as a Cisco does? Well, we do it a couple of ways. Most of the time, we have the amount of business within our division that we can buy in triple prices. And truckload prices, for the most part, are the same no matter what you do. You get up to that truckload, you reduce your freight rate to get it to you. And so you can drive and find those higher bracket, lower cost range. Uh, but we're also part of a group called Unipro, which is you can buy a new co-op. And we are a member of that. So that actually has, that group has the largest buying power of any food service company in the world. So. By, by doing the, by having good market share within the markets we do exist in and being part of these different co-ops, we can be competitive on price just as good as, as any single company. 
Uh, as far as growing and competing with them, it's it's the same thing. Just being that consultant, being that a lot of companies uh, are going more towards the electronic, online ordering, less DSR presence, so they're not getting as many people coming by and seeing on them and checking on them. We're going the other way. We're saying, okay, if everything's going all technology, we're going to make sure at the end of the day we have people seeing the customers, calling on them, seeing what their needs are, looking at their restaurants, and, and, and being there. That's not to say the other, the other companies aren't doing that, but they are making a concerted effort to, to compete with Amazon where we just want to be that person that always has somebody that's helpful at their, at their call. Uh, I like larger chain restaurants, larger you get, you know, it's all on the TV, they like to, <laughs> they always try to get the same products, it's like, you know, uh, they feel education of the customers, you know, anywhere they go, they get the same deal. Right. So we have three different categories of customers. We've got the street accounts, which is kind of the bread and butter of what we do, and that's, uh, that's your typical single location, mom and pop stock customers. Uh, and that's 70% of, of the sales that we do in San Antonio are all based on those groups. Uh, then we go into the program accounts. And those are kind of the regional chains. You know, they've got five to, to 15 unit type places. So uh, Free Birds, uh, Wings and More, uh, you know, some of those places around here we kind of fall in that program account range. That also gets worked by our sales force. And we put programs together with them. It's usually locked in pricing and agreed upon contracts. And then we go into our national account market, which those are the big boys like the BJs and you know, the, the Chili's of the world and, and those places. And we do a lot of business with them as well. Uh, we do business there to, to move volume. So that allows us to have more trucks, more routes, more delivery opportunities for new customers. Uh, it allows us to keep our operations <coughs> up so when we bring on new customers, we want to add a bunch of new people real quick to, to get ready. We've already got people in place. Um, and those are, are controlled by our corporate office. So they go after that, that type of business as a complete company. And so we'll say, okay, we do business in these markets, we're going we're gonna to do business in all these areas. You know, Sonic is a good example of. <coughs> One that we recently got, you know, they're a nationwide company, but they wanted to use us in every market that we exist in. But you have different franchise groups that you're working with, so that's all that's all handled from a corporate level, so that it's all streamlined and on one page. And then they let the divisions know, okay, you need to stock these products and you need to call these people. And this is how you work with things. So that the the real big change are done from a corporate level and is dictated back down to the divisions how we're supposed to serve. Uh, so you were mentioning uh, out of San Antonio, you lost service from Del Rio, that was Columbus, and the last Columbus, and then um, we'll wing all the way down to the valley. Uh, yes, and then Houston services out to Sealy. That's only like an hour east of Houston, up to Melville. So, yeah. uh, is there any rhyme or reason for that as far as uh, like Houston only service an hour east and San Antonio is covered? Houston does go further west. They actually go into New Orleans, but that wasn't the original plan because Houston has so many people and so many restaurants that you want to drive the least amount as you can. So yes, we go into New Orleans and Louisiana and all of that, but the majority of our sales force out of the Houston division is in Houston because there's so much opportunity right there that we can sell a whole lot of move a whole lot of groceries uh, without driving a whole lot of miles. That's, that's just more profitable. So San Antonio, uh, we were talking to Cody earlier, San, our best market out of San Antonio Division is actually awesome because it's got a really good food presence, it's got sort of good operators, really have good business conversations with. San Antonio has it too, but San Antonio is more of a, uh, a more conservative restaurant groups. So they, you know, they're third generation family owned, and, but we're, we're, we're breaking into those groups as well and uh, starting to So, I want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of Benny Keith itself. So, the company itself is 113 years old. It started out as a produce company, and then 
during uh, Prohibition, they kind of, Anheuser-Busch was looking to do things, they couldn't sell beer, so they're getting the ice creams and started working with them in different areas. And then after Prohibition went to, uh, they had that relationship built, so they became the first private distributor of Anheuser-Busch products. And uh, still they're one of the longest, largest distributors uh, today. But we do operate as two separate companies, so there's the beverage division and the food division. Uh, we can't work together on customers, but we can share benefits and things like that, so it's a, it's a good, good mix of things. It's also a privately held company. The, the, the entire company is owned by one family in the DFW area. Our corporate headquarters is in Fort Worth where everything started. Um, and it's completely debt free. So I'll show you a picture of our San Antonio division here in a second. But they built the San Antonio division, which is 625,000 square foot facility. They're building a brand new division from a company they bought in Alabama, and they're building a new warehouse in New Mexico. All of which are being paid for without having to raise any money from stockholders or having to go to banks and ask for loans that they have to pay back. You might ask, what does that mean? That means we can make sound long-term decisions now that we don't have to appease a stock price or anything along those lines uh, to live up to. Uh, so this is the footprint, kind of visual we talked about earlier on where we go. Uh, we're already exceeding some of those some of those boundaries now. That kind of gives you an idea of where, where we live and what our world looks like as of today, but we're still growing. Uh, as mentioned, we just moved into the Alabama area, which is getting into Georgia, and even touching the South Carolina out of that facility now. And then Oklahoma continues to, to go north up into Nebraska and even into Illinois. Yes? How does San Antonio compare to everywhere else? Look like Smash Bars. Who's the biggest? Uh, we are the third largest division right now, but we're soon to be the second. So they split us twice already. Uh, Houston didn't exist until 2013. So we used to ship out to San Antonio all the way to New Orleans. Uh, but when Houston opened, we were able to stop that. And back to our point earlier, be a lot more profitable, driving the same product, less miles. Uh, but we've already exceeded all the sales we were doing when we had all that territory. We had to pass that up within our own markets. So we're, we're, we're soon to pass Oklahoma, who's the, the second. Fort Worth is the largest, that's where it started. And then Oklahoma is currently number two uh, by the end of. I think by the end of our fiscal year, which is July, we'll probably be in the So when y'all stood up and put one in the sand, I mean in Houston, mm -hmm. they uh, y'all actually got like y'all covered all what y'all had beforehand without it being a area. We did. We had a big campaign to double our sales in San Antonio, and uh, it took us two years. Well, it was a three-year plan we did in two years to cover all the things. Um, when you were New Mexico um, facility, how far north? Uh, well, New Mexico is a very small operation right now. They're gonna, they're the one of the ones getting a new one, a new building, which has kind of restricted their ability to do some things. But Amarillo, the West Texas division is in Amarillo. That's going all the way up into Denver now. They've got sales teams in Colorado City and Pueblo, Colorado. Um, once New Mexico gets their new facility, they're actually going to come down. They're doing some business in El Paso, but that's going to be their new big market uh, because El Paso has got a lot of people. Uh, we have some there, but they'll be able to service all that area and then help uh, counter the, the stuff that never really up in the uh, Don't have a lot of uh, desire to cross the mountains at this point, but uh, you know most of our growth is coming this way and then up to the central part of the country. <coughs> Here's our new uh, facility outside of San Antonio in Selma. That's the 625,000 square foot facility I was talking about. So we just opened this a year ago, almost exactly. And we went from 17 acres to 87 acres here, and from about 225,000 square feet to, to over 600,000. And again, all paid for, debt free, ready to go, which means we don't have to raise uh, customers' prices to, to make up for that or to do any, any kind of unethical practices. There is, uh, with the growth we're talking about, there's a lot of opportunities within the company. Um, there's uh, some, some aging sales force, some people looking to retire. Uh, there's quite a few folks out of this program that have come on and been doing some things that do 
done a fantastic job. Some of them are already in short period, time period being looking at uh, possible promotions and things like that just because of the growth and expansion and the opportunities uh, that are existing. One of the great ways uh, to kind of learn each other is through a summer internship program we have. It's called our Aspire program. And I'll show a quick video on it and then uh, answer some questions on that. Piece. benefit I think of this internship and now coming back to Benny Key was rotating through the different departments and I was able to further build a relationship with each and every one in the different departments and I feel like when I come back I will have no problem going to anyone because I know everyone is here to help one another. From day one everyone kind of told me um, I kind of kept hearing the same thing. Benny Keith is a family. Benny Keith cares about our customers. Benny Keith cares about what we do for our team, how we um, how we approach people. And after my internship, it kind of started. Everything started sticking. You realize that after many people tell you that we're family, that people actually believe it. On our first visit to Geo, um, I think that was really kind of something that was um, a pivotal moment in this internship program, getting to meet some of the Hallams and the executive leadership, that was just a huge uh, kind of eye-opener to how great of a company that he is. We were very fortunate during our Aspire internship program last summer to partner with our partners at General Mills to provide a learning opportunity for our interns. In this regard, we had several General Mills professionals come in and do a fairly detailed presentation on the aspects of our business relationship, specifically from the perspective of a major manufacturer. I think it was a, um, a huge opportunity for Michaela to see a broadline distributor and live the life of a broadline distributor. Uh, it's kind of interesting. She's been with General Mills maybe seven to eight weeks now, and she probably has a better working understanding of a broadline distributor than almost anybody in our whole building, uh, which I think is really unique. And it, it, and we are leveraging her and her insights to help us. And I talk a lot about reverse uh, consultative um, selling it and. and uh, she's a reverse consultant for us, so as an internal, we're supposed to be training her. She's coming back and training us. So it's been a wonderful opportunity for her to learn, but also us to learn from her. Got to fast forward through that. Put my uh, information up here, but that is a. Uh, it goes through Memorial Day week through the second week in August. The end of it that they're about to show is, is a graduation ceremony. We actually go and do a, a presentation with the executive team and talk about what you learned and what you liked. So it gives you a chance to, to meet the people uh, that run the company and have lunch with them and talk to those folks as well as everybody in the different departments and operations, and purchasing and sales and everything else that you learn about the things. Uh, if anybody is interested, there's my email on here. You can send me an email, I'll shoot you the link. To, to the piece where you can talk to me at any point in time, including today, I think we got 12 30. 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock? Okay. Yes. So, Ags, if you are interested in learning more about the food distribution industry, um, expanding your network with Keith Study, or finding out more about Vinny Keith, who will be serving the planes today <coughs> at 12 o'clock in room 209. Okay? And just know, I've been, I've had the opportunity to go to general.